Good evening, good evening, good evening, and it's so great having you with us tonight. Uh, Kara, if you can give me a little bit more up here, I'd appreciate it in the monitors. I'd appreciate that so much. We want to greet you at our friends and family night, or more specifically for us adults, Believe Night. What do you believe? It is incredible. It's amazing how most Christians today attending church do not know what they believe. And we have been on a journey since the beginning of the year examining the Bible truths that every Christ follower should be anchored in, standing on the promises of God's word. You will not be easily shaken in the time of storm. God's word, God's promises are life to us. The psalmist says they are like honey in the honeycomb. They are sweet and they are life-giving. We are just delighted that you're here tonight. We have a number of young adults that have joined us out of our united ministry. You'll see them walking in. They usually meet uh, around uh, the 8 o'clock hour. So if you see any, don't stare at them or anything. Just let them slip on in tonight. You have a number of materials that are being handed out to your table uh, tonight. Uh, one is a letter that I'll be explaining later uh, for you to take home and uh, for you to personalize and be able to mail uh, to our Michigan senators. Uh, the other would be a sermon study guide or a lesson study guide. Most of the Lakeside family realizes that when I teach or preach, I enjoy using a sermon or a lesson study guide. Don't feel bound by that. That has all of the scriptures I'll be using tonight on it. It has some delightful fill-in-the-blanks. My name's Phil, and I go with fill-in-the-blanks. And it is a retention device that I use. I find, I find that when I'm preaching or teaching, I'm able to increase retention with my listener if they're hearing and writing keywords down. And so that's the purpose of that. If you don't like it, don't feel pressured with it whatsoever. But uh, what a journey that we're going to be taking tonight in this special Believe Night session. A pastor was worried about his teenage son. Worried about where his teenage son would end up being and end up doing. We got the whole crew of young adults back there in the corner tonight if you're looking for them. Way to go, Cody. It's Cody, right? I remembered. And it, it's been a couple of months, and I remembered your name. They're all tucked back there. You go, you don't, don't, you don't be stuck there. Go on back there. Give our young adults a hand tonight. Yeah, 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 real good. LS, any of them come on in, you direct them over to the, the, the corner. Corner's not a bad place tonight. It's the best place. That's right. But this pastor was so worried about what is my son going to turn out being? He got an idea, a personality psychological test. He put three objects on his son's dresser. He put a bottle of Jack Daniels. He put a Sports Illustrated magazine there with the, that's right, the bikini special and and a Bible on that dresser. And he hid in the closet because he just knew that whatever his son picked up, whatever his son focused in upon, that would be his calling. The son came in, walked right away to the dresser, picked up the Bible and thumbed through the pages, put the Bible down, picked up the bottle of Jack Daniels and took a swig, picked up the Sports Illustrated, turned it sideways for the fold-out section. Suddenly, as this pastor watched his son grab the Bible and put it under his arm, take the Sports Illustrated in his hand, 
and then be able to coordinate the bottle of Jack Daniels all at the same time and run out of the room with him, he thought to himself, oh my God, he's going to be a congressman. <laughs> What's the latest coming to us out of Congress? One of the latest pieces of legislation to come out of our U.S. House of Representatives for our nation that right now is in the grip of a health crisis, economic troubles, crime, immigration, uh, illegal border crossings, education problems. What are they working hard at? What are they producing? Our House of Representatives, the Equality Act. The Equality Act. Tonight, I, I would entitle this presentation which is very unique for us on Wednesday nights. We're not going to be going into small groups. We're going to be focused right here this evening and ending into a, a great time of prayer. I'd, I'd entitle this presentation, and this is what it is, a presentation, the Equality Act, equity or inequality? The Equality Act, equity or inequality? With this legislation... Uh, on this week of the National Day of Prayer, which is officially tomorrow, we are facing the most serious threat that these United States of America has ever faced when it comes to her religious freedoms. Tonight I'll be explaining what has brought us to this point in American history. What's the historical context? What is our biblical basis for rejecting the LGBTQIA plus lifestyle. What's the purpose of the Equality Act? What are the ramifications of the Equality Act in terms of our rights of uh, religious freedom, religious liberty, and, and free speech? Tonight... As we go into this presentation, if there's anyone that we need to be here tonight, and I'm so glad that you're here at this very, and I'm not being melodramatic, this very serious hour that the church and Christianity finds itself in, we need to invite the most important person here tonight. Amen? I thank the Lord for the, the awesome praise team and the worship tonight. Let's again honor the Lord in our prayers this evening. Father, in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh Holy Spirit, that you will be here tonight, that Jesus will be preeminent, that, Lord, we will be Christ-centered, that we will be word-based, and that we'll be Holy Spirit-filled. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Equality Act's historical context in 1972, and you can begin to fill in the blank, the National Coalition of Gay Organizations set forth their goals for both the federal and state level. Here's a summarized version of, think of it, 1972. Think of how many years we're going back. 49 years ago, this is what the gay coalition planned to do. This was their agenda, repeal of all laws prohibiting private sexual acts involving consenting adults. Repeal of all laws prohibiting prostitution, both male and female. Repeal of all laws governing the age of sexual consent. Repeal, number four, of all legislative provisions that restrict the sex or number of persons entering into a marriage unit and the extension of all legal benefits to all persons who cohabit regardless of sex or numbers. In other words, to redefine marriage and family. This was their goal, to do this for the first time in world history. Number five, enactment of legislation so that child custody, adoption, visitation rights, foster parenting, and the like shall not be denied because of sexual uh, orientation or marital status. What I'm wanting you to see is what they envisioned back in 1972 and what they've been able to attain. Number six, encouragement and support for sex education courses prepared and taught by gay women and men presenting homosexuality as a valid, healthy preference and lifestyle as a viable alternative to heterosexuality. 
Now, 49 years later, write that down. 49 years later, what has occurred? 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removes homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. 1974, Kathy uh, Kaz becomes the first openly LGBTQ American elected any public office when she wins a seat on the Ann Arbor, Michigan City Council. 1977 to 1981, remember Billy Crystal, who played the first openly gay character in a recurring role on a primetime TV show called Soap, 1993, President Bill Clinton signs a military policy directive allowing closeted homosexuals to serve in the armed forces in a policy that became known as Don't Ask, Don't Tell. 2009, President Obama signs the Hate Crimes Pre Prevention Act into law expanding the federal hate crime law to include crimes motivated by a victim's sexual orientation or perceived gender identity. 2011, Don't Ask, Don't Tell is repealed, ending a ban on gay men and lesbians from serving openly in the military. 2014, Houston's mayor issued a subpoena, do you remember this, demanding a group of pastors turn over any sermons dealing with homosexuality and gender identity. Those failing to comply could be held in contempt of court. 2014, Kurt Deline, Idaho, city officials order two ordained uh, Christian ministers to perform same-sex weddings or face jail time and fines. 2015, the Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage in the United States. At that pivotal juncture, marriage and family was redefined for the very first time in world history. 2015, the Scouts, the Boy Scouts of America removed the national restriction on openly gay leaders and employees. Now they're bankrupt. 2016, President Obama announces the designation of the first national monument to LGBTQ rights. 2016, the Pentagon lifts the ban on transgender people serving openly in the U.S. military. 2019, following California, Oregon, Colorado, New Jersey, all Illinois public schools, starting with preschoolers, starting with preschoolers, are legally required to teach children LGBTQ history. 2019, Mayor, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, after kissing his husband, became the first openly gay U.S. presidential candidate in United States history. 2020, coming up to present day, our culture now has more than 70 gender identification and sexual orientation forms and terms. I hope you understand. I won't have time to cover every, every one of those tonight. Rather than LGBT, it is now technically LGBTQIA+. To include lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, intersex, asexual, with the plus standing in for any other designation. February 25th, 2021, the House of Representatives, with a Democratic majority, passes H.R. 5, the Equality Act. Soon, it will be more than just political incorrectness for me to speak and teach and minister the way I will be speaking tonight. Very, very soon, it will be a hate crime with me having the liability to being uh, arrested and your pastor put in jail. But I'm going to keep preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep preaching the word. And I pray that you'll continue to proclaim it and that you'll live it and that you'll stand on God's word as our only anchor in times of storm. 
Again, it's impossible to, uh, in one evening, address every one of the sexual orientation and uh, uh, gender uh, identity uh, terms and ideology that is out there today. I will primarily be focusing on homosexuality, which encompasses most, most of what we're dealing with tonight. Technically, homosexuality is a word that covers both male and female same-sex relations uh, and attractiveness. And if a transgender, a transgender is biologically male, but claims a female identity and is sexually attracted to men, it again falls in the homosexual uh, attraction camp. So the principles I'll be dealing with tonight uh, apply to all. Let me say, let me say, as we are being videoed tonight, and this will be posted, uh, let me say right from the start to any in the LGBTQIA plus community that are listening, we love you in the name of Jesus. We welcome you to our church. We welcome you to this family to experience the good news of Jesus Christ uh, who has set us all free, uh, who has saved all of us from whatever darkness that we have fallen in. His grace is greater than any sin. Tonight, deceptions regarding the Bible and the LGBTQ lifestyle. Let me deal with a number of deceptions that I have been confronted with throughout my ministry and perhaps you have encountered. These could be questions that you have come tonight with. Number one, I've been told the Bible is silent on the LGBTQ lifestyle. Starting with the Bible's very first page, very first chapter, God establishes us as persons possessing very specific sexual identities. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, so God created man in his own image and he created them what? Male and female, he created them. The purpose of sexual union is not only for procreation. The purpose of sexual union is for relationship. It is for intimacy. It is for oneness. God said in Genesis chapter 2, it is not good for the man to be alone. And all the men would say, amen. I will make a helper suitable for him. Note, I will make a helper that's perfect, suitable for him. What did God make? Verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. And you'll note throughout Scripture that that wife, both Old and New Testament, is always, always female. In this regard, Eve, and they became one flesh. Those embracing LGBTQ, and I'll just end with Q just to save me time tonight, LGBTQ lifestyles are rebelling first and foremost against what? God's created order. At its heart, and for those of you in the LGBTQ community, you might not even be aware of this, but at its heart, at its core, your behavior, your lifestyle is rebellion against the Creator and His created order. The Bible does not specifically condemn homosexuality, it is said. The Bible does not specifically condemn transgenderism, it's said. It's unclear. It's fuzzy. It's ambu ambiguous. It's really all a matter, you Christians, of interpretation. I want you to know right from the very start, God's word is not ambiguous about what you're seeing on the screen. God's word is not fuzzy in respect to what you're viewing on the screen. 
regarding the LGBTQ lifestyle. Hear the word of the Lord. Leviticus 18.22 Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Deuteronomy 22.5 A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. With the motivation here that is very clear. This is not dealing with women wearing pants tonight. I hope you understand that. The whole principle here that God is dealing with is an attractiveness, uh, a, 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 a sexual arousal in dressing like a woman or dress a woman dressing like a man, gender role confusion and a, a gender identity that again is a rebellion against your biological birth. Gender. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Now I want to ask you, what's unclear about that? What's, what's unclear about thou shalt not? God's operative word to the LGBTQ community and lifestyle is thou shalt not. Here's another one that I've, uh, I've been confronted with. Uh, scriptures condemning the LGBTQ lifestyle were only for ancient times and don't apply to us today. Pastor Phil, I mean, they weren't allowed to eat certain things like shrimp that we eat today. That was part of the law. Pastor Phil, uh, uh, they had to do uh, animal sacrifices back then. That was part of the ceremonial law. So those laws forbidding the LGBTQ lifestyle, they don't apply today. I want you to be under, uh, understanding and keenly aware commandments like those prohibiting homosexuality from the book of Le Leviticus or anywhere in the entire Old Testament are timeless laws of God. There were three categories of God's laws. Civil law dietary or ceremonial law, and moral law. The New Testament did away with the ceremonial laws. For instance, sacrificing the blood of lambs, goats, bulls. The New Testament did away with ceremonial law and with civil law, but never God's moral law. God's moral law is thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill. Those are God's immutable, unchanging laws. God's moral law is strongly reaffirmed as his unchanging will in the New Testament. If we eliminate all of God's moral laws, we would eliminate his prohibition against adultery, bestiality, incest, child sacrifice, along with homosexuality and transgenderism. But Pastor Phil, how can commandments like Leviticus 20.13 apply today if God said the punishment is death if you commit homosexuality, for example? Let's read it. Leviticus 20, 13, if a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be upon their own heads. Pastor Phil, if that law applies today, why aren't we as a church then, why aren't we supporting and endorsing the killing of LGBTQ lifestyle people? I'll tell you why. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us. The Lamb of God was slain and killed upon the cross of Calvary. And he not only uh, carried the sins of the LGBTQ community, he carried your sins and my sins. He died that we might live. Uh, he became forsaken that we might be forgiven. He became poor that we might become rich. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because 
because he became sin for all of us. Amen. But Jesus, I've been told, never even mentioned homosexuality. Jesus never, ever mentioned it in his four Gospels. He never taught on it. He never preached on it. I've even had pastor friends challenge me on this one. Jesus didn't need to condemn homosexuality because what was the Bible of Jesus' day? Not the New Testament. The Bible of Jesus' day was the Old Testament. And the Old Testament law was extremely filled with specificity and detail on these sins and God's will towards them. And what did Jesus say about the Old Testament law? Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them plus plus Jesus reaffirmed God's will for human sexuality remember what Jesus said he cited God's original plan at creation read with me Matthew chapter 19 Jesus answered and said to them have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. I want you to know there's nothing in between. And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, who is what? Female, a woman, and the two shall become one flesh. Now here's the clincher. Look at verse 6. Here's the clincher. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together. What has God joined together? Man and woman, husband and wife. Let no man put asunder. Let no man separate. Let no one. House of Representatives. Senate, U.S. President signing it into law, let no one put it asunder. Jesus underscores the fact that God makes us either male or female, and sex is only blessed under the covenant of marriage. A marriage between a female and a male, he never entertains, notice, any other option, but he adds the warning, what God has joined together, let no one separate. But Pastor Phil, I've been confronted with. The Bible only condemns, the Bible only condemns promiscuous homosexual acts and not committed homosexual relationships like same-sex marriage. Basically, once you're enjoying a same-sex marriage, you're under God's blessing because he only condemns promiscuous, uncommitted same-sex acts. Is that what God's Word says? Read with me Romans chapter 1, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. What are we discussing here? Lesbianism. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Here is the clearest passage condemning homosexual acts. Whether it's an act that is promiscuous or in same-sex marriage. Both homosexual lust and activity are denounced here. As being what? Two words. Vile passions. 
Notice Paul says they exchanged the natural use for what is against nature uh, or that which is unnatural, meaning that there is a natural way and there is an unnatural way to have a sexual relationship. Again, it's a direct reference to rebelling against God's created order. But Pastor Chris, I have gr gay friends, and they're wonderful, they're friendly, they're loving, and I feel it is all right. I got that response from a 19-year-old Assembly of God missionary. And it's, uh, uh, young adults, let me just warn you, it is well known with the younger generations that they ascertain truth based upon how they feel versus objective reasoning and facts. We can feel all day long that that cup on the kitchen counter that has a lemony look to it, we can feel all day long that it's sweet lemonade. But honey, sir, ma'am, it's bleach. And you, you can feel all day long that that's sweet lemonade, but if you drink it, it's going to kill you. We're called by God's word and even by good science. Use your head. Use wisdom. Look at the facts. Add it up. We are led by faith, not faith without reason. We, we, our faith should be grounded in the veracity, the truthfulness of God's word and reason. When the liberal clergy, when the liberal clergy unite gays in holy matrimony, or when a denomination, and they're right here, in our area, when a denomination ordains gay clergy, it is deception. It is diametrically opposed to God's word, his will, and his way. And note, it's prophetic that we are in the last of the last days. Peter said this, there will be false teachers among you. Many will follow their evil teaching that there is nothing wrong with sexual sin. And because of them, Christ and his way will be scoffed at. How about this argument? How about the gene argument? The genetic predisposition argument. Gays are born gays. Don't you know I have no choice in this? I was born this way. I was born to have this disposition. Next time somebody tries to sell you that bill of goods that gays are born gay, I want you to point to the many studies involving identical twins. Studies involving identical twins. Genetically, they are identical. Yet, only one of the two siblings has become homosexual. The other has remained entirely heterosexual. Dr. Neil Whitehead conducted 20 years of scientific research into homosexuality with more than 10,000, 10,000 scientific papers, publications, and his big focus was on a twins study, identical twins study. And he writes this, look at the screen, the quote, these very complex comparisons of identical twins and non-identical twins definitively rule out genetic determinism. If homosexuality were genetic, identical uh, co Twins of homosexual men and women would also be homosexual 100% of the time. But the gay gene is not there. The majority of the research points to environment. The majority of the research points to choice. Choice. Choice in behavior and not biology. 
Dr. Charles uh, Socrates, professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and leading expert on homosexuality, he writes this, and I quote, homosexuality, the choice of a partner of the same sex for orgiastic satisfaction is not innate. You're not born with it. There is no connection between sexual instinct and the choice of sexual object. Such an object choice is what? Learned, acquired behavior. There is no inevitable, genetically inborn propensity towards the choice of a partner of either the same or opposite sex. He spent over 40 years treating gays, with 33% of them returning back to a straight lifestyle, heterosexuality. How about this argument? Have you been hit with this one? God is a God of love. To be against the LGBTQ lifestyle is to demonstrate a lack of love. We say no. We love every soul that God has created. We love you. We love you, the homosexual, the, the uh, LGBTQ community. We love you. You've been created in the image of God. But we reject your behavior. And we deem it as sinful. It misses the mark of God's will, his word, and his ways. To ask that God's love be content with us just as we are in our sins, in our pig pen like the prodigal, is to ask God to cease to be God. If God doesn't address our sin issue, God's not a loving father. But God, God has sent his very best. God didn't send a new social doctrine, a new age idea. God didn't send an angel. He sent his very best. Why? He sent Jesus to rescue us from our sins. He's a, a God of love. For God so loved the world. That's everybody. No matter what your lifestyle that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Real love is at stake here. Real love does not leave you like the prodigal in the pig pen, but says, come home, my son. <laughs> and God greets us when we come home to him. The main reason we're in opposition to the gay philosophy, the LGBTQ lifestyle is because we believe the Bible. I don't have a choice in this. I'm called to be a follower of God's word. It'd be so much easier just to say, well, if they want to be that way, let them be that way. If they, if they want to enjoy same-sex marriage, then let them enjoy that and look the other way. Don't talk about it. Don't worry about it. If it doesn't affect you, you know, let them do what they want. It's a free country. But the reason we're in opposition, the reason that uh, we preach and teach is that we are called to be men and women, people of the word. We're Christ's followers. We have no other choice in this but to proclaim his word, his gospel, which is the inerrant, uh, infallible, immutable, indestructible, inspired, holy, authoritative word of God. Man might want to change laws and morality and values, but we serve the one who has said, I am the Lord thy God, and I change not. The purpose of the Equality Act. The purpose of the Equality Act is to equate LGBTQ rights with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You will not understand what we're up against. You will not understand the Equality Act until you hearken back 
to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The, the Civil Rights Act of 64 was enacted to prevent discrimination against individuals based on innate, how they were born, on innate and unchanging characteristics of race, color, national origin, and sex or gender, male or female. When the word gender or sex was written in the, the Civil Rights Act, the context of that day and the understanding, just as when you're filling out a form and it asks you what gender, what sex you are, you're going to either mark male or female. Any confusion there? That's just how the Civil Rights Act was written. Congress rightly recognized that people were being denied basic human rights and privileges afforded to others, especially uh, in respect to housing and employment and education. They were being wronged only because of their skin color, their race, their national origin, their sex. However, the Equality Act, H.R. 5, this bill has redefined the word sex. And now this is at the heart of everything I'm talking about tonight. Sex for Congress right now is no longer male or female. They are including in the word sex, sexual orientation and gender identity. They are rooting this issue in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They're putting a self-perceived sexual orientation. They're putting a self perceived gender identity on the same legal level as race, skin color, and birth gender. The Equality Act creates a whole new protected class of people within society, protecting them against any discrimination, the LGBTQ community. Let me be clear so there's no misunderstanding since this will be broadcast publicly. Let me be clear. There should never, ever be the denial of basic human rights towards anyone, heterosexual or LGBTQ. Never. Yet on the other hand, no class of people should be given special rights over others. There should be no special LGBTQ rights, just as there should be no special heterosexual rights. Only American rights for all that is already contained and included in our Constitution. And not at the expense of religious liberties. Let's look at the legislative status of the Equality Act. The legislative status of the Equality Act. President Biden has stated, both in his campaign speeches and in his first 100 days, that passing the Equality Act was his number one legislative priority in his first 100 days. The bill passed. The House of Representatives on February the 25th, 2021. The Democratic-controlled House passed it immediately. It's presently being debated right now in the Senate. If H.R. 5 passes the Senate, President Biden will surely sign it into the law of the land. If the Equality Act becomes the law of the land, it will be the first major piece of legislation in all American history to discriminate against people of faith and violate the religious freedom of millions of Americans. You need to understand 
the serious hour in which we are at. So, Pastor, what are the consequences of the Equality Act if it becomes the law of the land? If the Senate passes this legislative article, this is what it would do. Here are the ramifications. Here are the consequences. The word sex would no longer be defined as the biological reality of being male and female. It would now also include the concepts of sexual orientation or gender identity. Secondly, with the exception of ministers like myself, the Equality Act would force churches and faith-based organizations like Christian colleges, Christian daycares, uh, Christian counseling centers. The Equality Act would force churches, faith-based organizations to hire employees who do not share their beliefs. Churches would not be protected from hiring decisions related to other employees, non-ministerial employees, like in this church. Here we have clerical employees. We have director employees. We have custodial employees. We have daycare worker employees. We have tech booth, sound booth employees. We have nursery, Sunday morning nursery staff employees. All of these would fall under the Equality Act. Failing, failing, failing to hire a person due to their LGBTQ lifestyle would be illegal. The Equality Act number three would require all places open to the public, including churches, to offer non-discriminatory facilities. You and I have grown up from the LGBTQ mindset. We have all grown up with discriminatory facilities. What am I referring to? Restrooms. Men's restroom, women's restroom, that's discrimination. Men's dressing room, women's dressing room, that's discrimination. Men's locker room or boys' locker room, men's lo uh, women's locker room, girls' lo that's discrimination. So what does this open the door to? For instance, biological males identifying as females could use our women's restrooms here in this church campus. And it would be illegal, it would be illegal for our security team to run a man who's identifying as a woman out of our women's restroom. Folks, I am not making this up. This is not science fiction. I hope you understand this. This is all within the Equality Act. Number four, the Equality Act would force health care providers to provide abortions and gender transition treatments. Health care providers could no longer refuse procedures requested by LGBT patients based upon religious grounds. For instance, doctors could be required to perform abortions against their beliefs. For, they would be forced to perform an abortion, for example, upon a lesbian or upon a, a transgender uh, individual, biologically female, but transitioning into a man. If they request an abortion, that doctor will be forced to do it or will be guilty of discrimination. They would also be required, despite your religious beliefs, if you are a doctor, you will be required to perform a gender-affirming treatment or surgery. If a doctor 
performs a mastectomy on a woman who has breast cancer. This doctor would also be required to perform a double mastectomy on a biological female who identifies as a transgender male or face discrimination charges and lawsuits. This is the new world that we are rapidly moving into. Number five, the Equality Act would jeopardize girls and women's athletic and educational opportunities. H.R. 5 would require gender-based athletics to be available on how students self-identify instead of the biological sex that they were birthed with. For instance, a young man that kept trying and trying and trying to make uh, first string uh, uh, on the uh, basketball team but can't make first string uh, on, the, on the guy's basketball team, he comes to school one day and tells the girl's high school basketball coach, I identify as a woman. He joins the girl's basketball team. He's not only first string, but uh, he's number one on the team, and he robs the girls on that team from scholarship availability and so forth and, and, and so on. The Equality Act number six would threaten religious freedom and free speech. The Equality Act threatens religious liberty like no other legislation in all American history. But Pastor Phil, what about our First Amendment rights? What about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act? of 1993. If you're asking that, you've got a great memory and you've got a great legal basis in mind. The uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 was sponsored by who? Congressman Chuck Schumer. And it was moved through the Senate by who? Senator Ted Kennedy, the religious, get a hold of this, the Religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act was signed into the law of the land by President Bill Clinton, 1993. What does, and you need to understand, churches, Christian colleges, Christian organizations, uh, uh, Christian businessmen and women have relied upon the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as their defense when they have been sued because they will not be the wedding photographer at a lesbian wedding. They have fallen back on the basis of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act Signed into law, 1993. This law prohibits the government from creating restrictions on how you might practice your religion unless there's a compelling state interest for that. They, you know, the government won't allow child sacrifice, for example. If that's your religion, they won't allow that. But it is very, very uh, broad in protections. Note on the screen with me, the act allowed individuals to sue the government if they believe that their religious rights are violated by the government. Again, this was all authored by Schumer, by Kennedy, and Bill Clinton. However, the Equality Act specifically eliminates the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as a defense. It would be no longer a defense for us. The Equality Act reads this way. Look on the screen. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 shall not provide a claim concerning or a defense to a claim under a covered title or provide a basis for challenging the application or enforcement of a covered title. Section 1107. The language invokes religious freedom protections. It removes it that which we've enjoyed, 
since the birth of the Bill of Rights. Churches, Christian ministries, Christian businesses will not be able to use it as defense any longer if we're charged with a violation of the Equality Act and violations of the Equality Act could very well threaten the tax-exempt status of our churches, Christian organizations, and schools. Pastor, how could the Equality Act impact preaching and teaching? The Equality Act lays the groundwork. It, it, it becomes the legal foundation for all further attacks against Christianity and people and organizations of faith. The Equality Act will lay the groundwork for making preaching and teaching against the LGBTQ lifestyle a hate crime. A hate crime. A counseling ministry that is able to bring healing and hope to those that are trying to leave the LGBTQ lifestyle and become heterosexual, they will be viewed as criminals because they are violating the Equality Act that is dead set against conversion therapy that is discriminatory and harmful, they say, to people emotionally and psychologically. Despite the fact that over a hundred years of scientific research shows a shift in one's sexual orientation as being possible, despite the fact that countless testimonies of both men and women who have been delivered from same-sex attraction, they're all out there. Or those that have overcome a transgender identity and now embrace their their birth uh, biological sex. Despite all of this, it would be viewed as conversion therapy, a discriminatory, harmful, illegal practice. If I preach in the future about the opportunity of grace that is greater than all of our sin and the healing and the hope that is in Christ Jesus, and if I preach messages that have, for instance, the verse from 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul says that uh, you also, some of you, uh, 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 where he, he, he in the verse says that uh, robbers, thieves, murderers, adulterers, homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God, but some... Such were many of you, but you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying there to the Corinthians, the first Corinthians 6, that uh, you had that lifestyle, but you were converted, you were healed, you were saved and born again through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That would be viewed as a hate crime. That would be viewed as discriminatory, harmful an illegal practice. Look on the screen. Even if I preach in the future that marriage should only be between one male and one female, it would be identified as sexual stereotyping and discriminatory. It is, we're talking about a slippery slope here. We're talking about the Equality Act laying the groundwork for all future lawsuits and all future uh, attacks. But Pastor... Pastor, thankfully, we still have our First Amendment rights. Uh, Pastor, thankfully, we still have uh, the First Amendment that states uh, Congress can make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting its free exercise. That is known as the First Amendment. But do you remember last month what President Joe Biden stated in his April 8, 2021, Rose Garden speech. He said this, and I quote, but no amendment in the Constitution, no amendment to the Constitution is absolute. 
End quote. Many experts agree that the Equality Act is one of the gravest threats, write that down, most serious threats to religious freedom our country has ever faced. Even if the Equality Act doesn't become law, even if it does not become law, without revival, our freedoms will likely pass away. I'm referring to the cancel culture. As the forces of cancel culture become stronger and stronger and stronger in the land, conservative uh, businesses, conservative uh, organizations, even conservative celebrities in Hollywood have been canceled. Such is the power of cancel culture. They have faced boycotts. They have paid a heavy, heavy price for their values. They have been banned from media, social media platforms that we're well aware of deeming them as violating community standards if they voice conservative values, let alone Christian values. According to Dan Hitz of Reconciliation Ministries, a bookstore, a bookstore, you would know the name well, the giant retail bookstore of the land has just recently pulled books off of its shelf that offer healing and hope to those of the LGBTQ lifestyle, healing and hope in the name of Jesus, while at the same time promoting and offering Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, and Karl Marx's book, Communist Manifesto. A call to action. Lastly, a call to action. Before President Biden can sign H.R. 5, the Equality Act, into law, it will take 60 votes, 60, say that with me, 60 votes in the Senate for passage. What can you do? What can you do? We're going to offer you tonight the ability to contact your Michigan senators. You can contact our Michigan Senators, Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters. We're giving you the opportunity tonight. It, it is on your table, in the center of your table. There should be a, a half sheet of paper with red type on it, and you can write a old-fashioned, traditional, put it in the envelope letter. You can send an email. You can make a phone call. Uh, uh, you can contact them in a variety of ways and voice your opposition to H.R. 5, the Equality Act. We have also put on your table, because you might be saying, Pastor, I don't know what to say. We've given you a form letter. All you have to do is put your Jan, John Hancock on it or, or, or James Hancock on it or Janice Hancock on it. All you have to do is sign it and personalize it. The content is there for you. If you don't have any of these articles and items, just lift up your hand and Chuck Rockwell is handing them out. Chuck. Uh, and LS, if you could help, I've got a table over here in the corner that needs it. Others that have their hands up, we have a personalized letter. As you're leaving tonight, kids, I need your attention. As you're leaving tonight, I would like to have every single one of you sign a letter on the behalf of Lakeside Assembly of God. We want to send a letter from our Lakeside family with your signatures on it saying that you represent a church of more than a 1,000 people that call Lakeside their home church. Write your name down, and we have a form letter that states very eloquently in an articulate way our opposition to H.R. 5, the Equality Act. So two things, two things, so there's no ambiguity. Two things. A personal communication from you as an individual. And then together, let us sign together a corporate letter representing Lakeside Assembly of God. And this church family and our opposition to this uh, abysmal 
foolish, sinful legislation. Pastor, I have heard, Pastor, and stay with me, everybody. Keep your focus up here. Pastor, I have heard that Debbie Stabenow has already voiced her support of H.R. 5, the Equality Act. Pastor Chris, I've already heard that Michigan Senator Gary Peters is the co-sponsor of H.R. 5, the Equality Act. Doesn't matter. Still send the letter and still sign our church letter. It is important that you do so because by registering our opposition now, it provides more legal support later if the law is challenged in the courts. So you sending a, don't take the position that I'm only one person and my vote doesn't count. Listen, we, some of us were in election yesterday and uh, uh, that are here tonight. We were at our Michigan State uh, ministerial council yesterday and I've never seen it before in my life when the votes came in they were completely evenly divided like 223 for and 223 for the other guy and one vote made the difference one vote I'll tell you it makes all the difference in the world what can you do communicate to our senators Voice your opposition. More importantly, what can you do? Stand in God's word. Stand on his promises. The church right now is in the grip of, of an hour and a season of compromise. We're in an hour of compromise unlike uh, anything else that we've ever experienced, but not unlike what they experienced in the Bible. Even Moses with the children of Israel finally had to shout out and say to them, Who's for the Lord's side? Stand with me. And I believe we're in such an hour as this. Matthew 24, 13, Jesus said this, Only they who endure to the end will be saved. Only they who endure to the end will be saved. Jesus is coming back for overcomers. Jesus is coming back not for uh, uh, those that have a wet noodle as, as, as their spine, but those that have backbone and are standing up for Jesus Christ. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me. Though none go with me, I've decided to follow Jesus. The Lord is coming back for such a people. We're in the middle of sifting right now as never before. COVID has been a sifting. We've got people, I can tell you, because I've run into them at the store. I've run into them at Walmart, and, I, and, I, and I've said to them, why aren't you in church? Well, I'm afraid of COVID. Then what are you doing here in Walmart? I haven't seen you for over a year. COVID is separating the men from, from, from the bo boys from the men, men from the boys. Girls from the women and women from the girls. H.R. 5, the Equality Act, and how we're going to respond to it is a separator. Who's going to be for the Lord's side? Who will endure? You'll endure to the end if you stand on God's promises. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You'll not only endure, but you'll win the victory if you pray. I said, if you pray, if you pray, prayer isn't the preparation for action. Prayer is action in and of itself. It's the only supernatural weapon that God has placed within our hands. Think of the authority and the power that God has placed in your hands. Prayer can do anything that God can do. Jesus said, uh, in my name, in my name, whatsoever you ask in my name, anything that you ask, it shall be done. I want you to be reminded our fight's not against flesh and blood. 
Our fight is not against liberal ideology. Our fight is not against LGBTQ society or lifestyle or community. Our fight is not against uh, political parties. Our fight is not against the House of Representatives or President Joe Biden. Our fight is against uh, supernatural foes, the forces of darkness, the halls of hell. Let there be no confusion in this. But our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons are not man-made. But they're mighty through God the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah. Remember, when you pray, when you pray, you're not talking to the president or a billionaire of limited means. You're talking to the all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent God. With him, all things are possible. Ask him to conquer your giants. Ask him to move your mountains. Ask him to pull down your strongholds. Ask him to split your Red Seas. Ask him to somehow, some way, make a way where there seems to be no way. Would you stand with me tonight? Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to pray? Are you ready to call down heaven tonight in the name of Jesus? I want us, I want us as Cindy's coming to the keyboard tonight to get ready to pray. There is power in corporate prayer. There is power when God's people come together and pray. Jesus said, if even two or three agree upon any one thing in my name, it shall be done. And whenever two or three gather together in my name, there I shall be in the midst of them. I've asked different ones to lead us in prayer tonight. And I'm going to ask for L.S. Sexton to begin this tonight. They're going to come and pray one-minute prayers. And then I'm going to shout out to you and everybody in agreement, say amen. I've asked different ones of you to pray, and so the one that will be on deck, uh, if you're led to pray, just come up and get ready to grab the microphone. But we're going to start with L.S. tonight. Raise your hands towards heaven this evening, each and every one of you this evening. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of yes, Jesus, Jesus tonight. Jesus. We humbly and reverently come before Hallelujah. you this great need and this great hour. Yes, Lord. And Father, in the past, I've read in your word where you stopped the mouth of the lion. Yes. And you quenched the fiery darts. Yes. You have stopped the people from being burned alive. And God, this is a light thing for you. Yes, Lord. Lord, in the past, you've given the Herodians nightmares. And you, yes, Lord. You let the Herodians speak to the Herods and say, yes. do not touch this man. God, tonight I'm asking you that you'll give those husbands and wives of the politicians nightmares about this, about this HR5. In I pray, God, that they will say, you don't want to sign this. I pray, God, that you'll give them a shaking. And I pray, God, for every politician that is thinking about signing this, this act, I pray against it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against this act, and I claim the forces of hell, and I push them back to the pits of hell where they belong, and I claim the power of God over that. And I just ask you, God, that you will show us your glory Thank one you, more Jesus. time, that you will revive our Thank church you, one more time, that Thank you will give us the grace one more time Hallelujah. and help the church to stand against Do this like again, never before. Do and God, again, I'll give you praise. I'll give you glory. I'll give you honor, God. And we will all say it is the Lord that has done yes, this great God. deed. We will be glad to say it is good that you have been with us again, God. You, you have ne never left us and you Lord never will Jesus. leave us, God. And I praise you, mighty God, Hallelujah. for doing this for us in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody name, would pray. say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. My prayer is that you would take some extra sheets. Amen. I have some. I have four children, and they're all Christians. So we magnify our go. effectiveness by taking some Amen. of these to neighbors and friends Amen. and relatives Praise who would do that. Amen. Pray for us. Dear Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name you have of said Jesus. in your word, if we come Glory together, to God. that you are there with us. 
So we're going to give Jesus. thanks in advance, Lord, you, that Jesus. this bill will be defeated yes, and that your kingdom come it, will be going we on and it, on and on as in we are your servants Jesus. and we lift you up. Hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And everybody would say amen. Amen. Next prayer. Get on deck. Come on deck. John is coming at this time. John? Amen. Amen. Next praying person, get on deck. Lord, we thank you for this moment we find ourselves in. We thank you and we count it all joy. Yes, God. We look at it for what it is. Evil spawned thank in the you. labs of hell. Today, we, your remnant, are grateful for this Hallelujah. testing of our faith. For we know thank you who promised will be faithful. We yield our all to you this day. You thank said in Isaiah 46, remember the former things of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make Thank known you, the end from the beginning, from ancient times, Lord what is God. still to come. And I say my promise, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I purpose. Thank you, God, for the power of your word. Even here at Lakeside, we're forever grateful for our pastor who has taught us these truths uncompromisingly and how to stand on them, move in them, release the power that is in them. Today, Lord, come what may, we stand united here in this place. We believe your great and exceeding precious promises for us. Today we hearken to the voice of your word, for we know the fear of man can be a snare. You say, do not be afraid of them, for the great I am is with us, and you will rescue us, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You reach your hand and touch our mouth. Put your words in them, Lord. You are always watching to see that your words are fulfilled. You say the end of the matter is better than the beginning. The best is yet to come, even here at our church. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, we will obey you. We will have yes, courage. Lord. We will wait on you, and we will worship you. Thank Jesus, you. we choose to arm ourselves with the same attitude that was in you, and we Hallelujah. seek for your will to be done. Thank you, Jesus, for disarming the powers Hallelujah. and authorities of our enemy. Thank you for making them a public spectacle, triumphing over them by the cross. Thank you, Jesus. You encourage us to watch and pray and be not deceived by the deception coming. You said to look up for our redemption draws near. You said he who endures to the end shall be saved. Jesus, we consider you who endured such opposition from sinful men. So we will not grow weary and not lose heart. We trust you, Lord. So come whatever does. We know you. And yes, we know Jesus. your kingdom is not a matter of Praise talk, but of power. Thank you for the demonstration of the Spirit's power oh, that is coming. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Our faith chooses to stand and rest on your promises. Thank you that you will never leave us comfortless and that you will always be with us to the end. So we choose to watch, wait, hope, pray, and worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we look forward to what is to come. Hallelujah. Glory and honor and power to the one who is holy and worthy. Yes, In Jesus' name, amen. And everybody would say, amen. Yeah. Amen. Beautiful. amen. Beautiful. Who's on deck? Precious Heavenly Lord. Father, we just come to you, Lord, here tonight, Lord, dear Jesus. Lord, we bring our prayers to you, Lord, dear Jesus. We pray, yes, Lord, dear Jesus, for our senators tonight, Lord, dear yes, Jesus. Yes, dear Jesus. Lord, we just ask that you would just intervene, Lord, dear Jesus. Lord, we pray, Lord, dear Jesus, you would touch their hearts and touch their minds, Lord, dear Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As they review this bill, Lord, dear Jesus. We ask for the power of God's word to hit that seventh floor, Lord, dear Jesus. Yes, God. And just move upon that Senate, Lord, dear Jesus. Yes, dear Lord, Jesus. let these laws be changed, Lord, Breathe dear Jesus. Those. Lord, let your power stop them from moving forward, Lord, dear Jesus. We pray for our president tonight, Lord, dear Jesus. Lord, we pray, Lord, dear Jesus, that he would just review his, his, his processes, Lord, dear Jesus. And we just pray, Lord, that you would just be with him tonight, Lord. Jesus. Lord, we pray, Lord, that God's word would move forward, Lord, dear Jesus. Lord, that you would direct, you would guide, you would give us wisdom and direction in everything we do, Lord, dear Jesus. And Lord, let us stand on your word, Lord, dear Jesus, tonight, Lord, dear Jesus. And Lord, let us not be afraid, Lord, dear Jesus, for Lord, you are in control of every situation, Lord, dear Jesus. In God's name we pray, and all God's people in agreement would say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Thank you, Mike. Lord God, we just thank you, Lord God, that we can come to you tonight, Lord. Lord, we stand as people, Lord God, that are not silent, Lord God. We will not be silent, Lord God. You have not created us to be silent. We stand upon your word, Lord God. We tell Satan and all the enemies in hell that the blood of Jesus is against you. And we claim victory in this situation. We are courageous because we are the children of God. We are courageous and powerful because our commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ, goes before us. And the battle is ours. We already have won the victory. And Lord, right now we shout, victory is ours. Victory is ours because of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Give him all the praise. Give him all the glory tonight. Amen. Cindy, you have a chorus for us in closing. Amen. Just thank him right now for the victory. Thank him in advance. Hallelujah, that we're on the winning side. <laughs> that we serve the King of Kings, uh, the Lord of Lords. We praise you, Lord, that you have heard us. We praise you, Lord, that you're dispatching angels. We praise you, Lord, that you are breathing your spirit. Lord, we thank you that the King's heart is like water within your hands, uh, that you promote that you dispose, that you're on the throne, and everything's going to be all right. Lord, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to remind you tonight that if you did not get a letter, we can, we, you, we can serve you at the booth, that we have the information pieces at all the tables, and then for the corporate letter, that we're desiring for you to sign. You need to go to the cafe. I don't want to jam up the booth right here and jam up our hallway. I need you all to go to the cafe. My secretary will be there at the cafe uh, bar, the booth there, and you can sign the document there. Don't leave until I speak blessing over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that the grace of the Father and the love of the Son, Christ Jesus, 
and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit would be upon one and all. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you as you go with God.